All right, my name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here with Mike Hines from Franchere Wine. Uh, it's March 4th, 2020. We're at the Nicholson Library at Linfield College. Uh, Mike, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Uh, first question, as you know, uh, why wine? Well, um, it's interesting because in 2004 or so, I was in my sort of, you know, early mid 30s, and I was, um, I, I had actually this, um, cheese I got for a party and um, I uh, you know up to that point I thought you know wine is fine wine's nice you know who doesn't like wine but you know no big deal uh, so I went to I was living in Chicago at the time and I was um, uh, I went into a store called the wine discount center at that time and I asked what goes well with the humble fog cheese and the guy at the shop said, you should try a Vouvray, it will change your life. And funny enough, it did. It's kind of why I'm here. Uh, because I had actually never, uh, to that point, tasted anything like that. There was sort of the uh, before Vouvray era of my life and the, uh, you know, after Vouvray AV or something. Uh, anyway, it's, it, it was just, it was, it was like I, I had never tasted anything like that before. I said, what is this? Mm -hmm. uh, how did this wine come to be this way? And the way it, it uh, tasted with the cheese was phenomenal. So it was at that point that I went down the wine rabbit hole and I just started saying, well, okay, well, what else is out there? Mm -hmm. And so I started uh, asking questions at the wine shop. I sort of, you know, just trying different stuff, just uh, checking it out. Uh, and I started reading about it. A friend got me a uh, Oz Clark book as a gift. And decided, I started devouring that. And then that led to the next book, and then led to the next book, and to more wine. And at a certain point, I thought, well, I'm really enjoying this, so what about a career in wine at some point? So I was uh, working at the University of Illinois at Chicago, uh, at the School of Public Health, and uh, doing online you know, web development uh, for public health researchers and uh, public health agencies. And I got a part-time job, evenings and weekends, at a wine shop. And I was starting to think along the lines of, maybe I would like to um, go into a, to wine retail. Mm -hmm. uh, because at that point, I was really enjoying exploring the world of wine, uh, tasting broadly, whether it's you know, New Zealand, Italy, uh, France, whatnot. Uh, and I did that for four years. I, I worked at one shop uh, called Lush. Uh, did that for one year, met some wonderful people, and then after that, I worked for another shop, uh, uh, and um, actually, I uh, worked under the table in exchange for wine. Uh, I can say that because that wine shop doesn't exist any longer. Uh, but yeah, it was right there in the heart of Chicago, and it was a wonderful experience. Uh, but at the same time, I realized that retail was still retail. Mm -hmm. I learned a lot of valuable things, though. Uh, I, first of all, because I was working under the table and uh, getting paid in wine uh, rather than in cash, I was able to s continue drinking throughout the, the wine world, um, seeing what worked for me. Um, also, e even before I started working wine retail, as I was exploring um, the world of wine, uh, buying my own, I discovered two things. First of all, the newsletter that came out monthly from the Wine Discount Center, which is my local shop at the time, uh, everything was based upon uh, the point system. They would promote the wines with reviews from critics. Uh, and I found that almost invariably, the higher the points the, the wine received, the less I liked the wine. Uh, and also, there were certain wines that simply spoke to me uh, and so much of the time, it would be, uh, I would turn the bottle over, look at the back label, and it would say, 
uh, imported by Louis Dressner Selections. And so I said, okay, well, what's this all about? Why do I like these wines so mm -hmm. much? Mm -hmm. And so I was able to go online, look at uh, their philosophy. And so it was simply by responding to certain wines that I um, came to realize there was a certain kind of wine that worked for me mm -hmm. more than others. Mm -hmm. So as I intimated before, um, the, the, the wines I scored higher points, tended to like them less, in, you know, as a general rule. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was that the wine style at that time was for, you know, big showy flavors that would get big points. And I was more interested in uh, more nuanced wines and also uh, wines that were um, produced uh, specifically using native yeast uh, fermentation methods um, and a more sort of hands-off approach in the, in the winery. Uh, low, you know, minimal intervention. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, anyway, getting back to the, the narrative, at uh, working in the shops, I, like I said, I found that they were just, it was still retail, and I was going further down the wine rabbit hole, just really interested in the science aspect of it, the, the art aspect of it. So uh, for both family reasons and for the reason of wine, I decided to come back to Oregon and learn how to make wine, because I found out that uh, Chemeketa, um Community College had a wine studies and wine making uh, program. And so uh, I transferred to Oregon State University, was working there full time, and then started working part time uh, in the wine industry, as well as um, uh, working at a, um, a vineyard, as well as uh, taking classes. So my schedule was pretty full because uh, that was a full-time job that I had at Oregon State University. So uh, yeah, I, I got, uh, I, I didn't know how any of this would play out. I didn't have a specific plan to um, start uh, my own label, uh, to become a, the winemaker of my own operation. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what would happen, mm -hmm. but I fell into that pretty quickly. Um, I uh, started um, with the, uh, working harvest at uh, Illahi mm -hmm. um, in the Mid-Valley and I was able to take a lease on a small vineyard in the Aolamity Hills that had actually been um, unpr left unpruned and untended for a number of years. Uh, it was the kind of thing where you go to the school's vineyard and you learn how to do, uh, you learn how to prune, uh, shoot position the whole bit and then I would go over to that vineyard that looked just like it was a completely w wild overgrown a jungle um, uh, and I didn't know what I was looking at so I was I sort of jumped in with both feet mm -hmm. and learned uh, just what it took to bring a vineyard back to production mm -hmm. um, bring it back to life. It took a few years. The f first year that I um, um, was farming it didn't produce any fruit. It didn't have the, the material to produce, produce fruit. Uh, the next year, pretty much all the vines got zapped by frost in early May, so I didn't get any fruit that year. So in 2013, um, I wanted to um, start making some of my own wine. I, I had made a small amount in 2012 in a non-commercial basis. Uh, 2013, I said, what the heck? Just go for it, start making a small amount of wine, um, put it under my own label. And so I, I purchased some fruit from uh, a couple of different vineyards. And so that was the first year I had made Pinot Noir and Gruner Feltliner, a as well as the first year I made Syrah too. So the Syrah and the Gruner come from what is now the um, Van Duzer Corridor ABA, mm -hmm. and the Pinot is coming from the Yale Lambda Hills. So, yeah, that's it in a nutshell. I mean, it's just, that's sort of how I just sort of fell into it was partly by uh, accident, partly by just jumping into it. Um, I uh, ran a record label back in the 1990s, uh, and the whole ethos at the time, it's sort of, you know, it wasn't punk rock, but it's more experimental music. Mm -hmm. And um, the whole ethos of the time, especially in these, in the uh, early 90s, um, 
was DIY, do it yourself. And so people were recording their own music on lo-fi equipment in their basements. Um, uh, sometimes would you know release material on purpose, but that had a lot of tape hiss on it. Um, you know, Pavement was one of the big bands at that time of the era. Anyway, the, the bands that I was working with, they they weren't a single genre, but there'd be a you know a sort of indie rock band, and then a uh, you know noise artist, and then a um, you know more folky type artist. So it was it spanned the um, sort of a, a wide continuum of styles of music, mm -hmm. but the ethos was do it yourself. It didn't mean that if you did it, you were good, but it's, you didn't need anyone's permission um, to, to start up. Uh, and that did come out from the punk rock ethos of the, of the previous years as well. So I sort of had that ingrained in me at that point in time. So when it came time for me to think about making my own wine, I just, I'll just do it. If I'm no good at it, then I'm no good at it. But uh, we'll see what happens. So. Wine with a little bit, a little bit of tape hiss on it is, is totally fine. I think. Yeah, yeah. So, so let's back up a little bit. You mentioned coming back to Oregon. Sure. So you're originally from Oregon. So tell me about how you got, where, where you're from here, and then how you got into owning a record label. Oh well, so I, um, I uh, grew up in the Portland area. I was always into music growing up. Uh, when I went to college, which is in Southern California, uh, at a small liberal arts called uh, liberal arts college called Pomona College, I. Um, first day, went down to the radio station and said, I want to be a DJ. So I was very, very directed on that. And that's uh, where they had every conceivable uh, record was sent to them by all of the underground mm -hmm. bands and all the underground uh, labels at the time. So I really got a great education in the world of music. And again, it was one of the ethos of the time was people were just starting their own record labels and, and releasing records by their friends' bands. And that's what I did. So after I graduated from college, I moved back up to Portland and I started up the record label and was just releasing records by my friends. And eventually I would start writing people. Um, one of the first people I wrote was a Brooklyn guitarist. Uh, named Lauren Mazikane at the time. He's now called Lauren Connors. Um, but I wrote to him. I said, hey, they'd like to put out your music. And um, told him a little bit about what I was doing. And you know, sent him, told him, like, oh, I really like your, your stuff, and so on and so forth. And he wrote back, I think, um, it was two sentences. He said, uh, Mike, sounds good. I'll send you something. In, I'll send you new music in, in a week. <laughs> Lauren, okay. So that, people were willing to take risks on, on people they had never heard of to entrust them to release their music. Mm -hmm. So, What caused you to leave that and end up at, at, in Chicago doing web development? So that never, I never made any money on that. I only did that, again, after my day job. And so I had, after college, I had a, um, a crummy office job managing a database or something. And uh, then uh, working in a bookshop. And then uh, for the record label, I bought a book called uh, um, Teach Yourself HTML in Seven Days, So because I, I wanted a website to promote the, the record label. So I did that. And that's how I then was able to parlay that skill into working uh, first for uh, an uh, internet service provider, and then after that for a web development firm in, in Portland. 2001, um, there was first the um, uh, recession that hit. The company that I worked for was heavily dependent upon Intel for their client work. And because Intel stopped um, all sort of marketing purchases mm -hmm. uh, in January 2001, uh, a lot of people were laid off. Uh, I was not one of them, but it was a rocky time for the next couple of years. And that was only exacerbated, of course, by 9-11. Uh, because the Portland economy was slow to recover, and because I was just looking for a change, I wanted to live in a bigger city, 
I decided to move to Chicago. It was right around that time that, um, well, first of all, again, because of the, the economy, the records um, stopped selling. Mm -hmm. uh, and they weren't, again, big sellers to begin with, but they just, the, the, and I said, okay, I'm, I'm, I've been doing this for 10 years. I've never made any money at this. I've never been able to make a, even a part-time living off of it. So I think this is the time to just sort of walk away. Also, I was cognizant of how I was facilitating other people's creativity, and I thought that was all fine and good, but it, there was something where I was like, I want to facilitate my own creativity. I want to explore that, and I didn't know what that was. So that's when I, again, moved to Chicago, got the job at the university, um, doing web development there, and that's when, again, after those the progression of the years, mm -hmm. getting more and more into wine, I went, I found it. I found mm -hmm. what it is I want to do. So I'm curious, you, you talked about kind of the revelatory wine you had and then the, the, the rabbit hole. Uh, and you also talked about the retail aspect of it. So I'm, I'm curious, uh, in those years, as you were sort of teaching yourself wine or learning wine and also serving other people, also, also doing the retail part, what did you find was the most rewarding part of that for you and what was the, what was the toughest part for you? Well, there wasn't really a tough part. Um, working at a wine shop, people would come in in a good mood, uh, receptive. They were, they were specifically looking for wine. They didn't have to be sold on anything, uh, especially the second shop that I worked with. Um, uh, uh, the owner valued uh, treating his customers very well um, and really emphasizing uh, value-driven wines from small family producers. Mm -hmm. So, like Barbera d'Alba, for example, was just one of the many different types of wines in that sort of, um, you know, 15, 18 dollar price point that um, he, he was really excited to um, deliver great values for his customers. Mm -hmm. And that also made it easy for me because I was participating in something where I was, um, I felt giving the customers a, a great value, and I think a great experience, too. Um, people would come in, and they would be you know, interested to learn more sometimes. You could tell sometimes but people were a little shy, and they just wanted to pick something up off the shelf and, and pay for it, and that's fine, too. But the interactions with um, people were uh, really nice. Um, it was, I thought, a, a good way to connect with people. Um, it had you know, all the interesting stuff to talk about. Again, the, the art side of things, the science side of things. And that's the thing, as I was going down that wine rabbit hole and reading a lot uh, and, you know, learning as much as I could, mm -hmm. that's when I started learning more about uh, everything about uh, the effects of uh, climate mm -hmm. on grape growing mm -hmm. to uh, oak usage, um, just on and on and on. Everything about the whole sort of wine growing uh, from start to finish. Mm -hmm. And so I could talk to people as they wanted to receive certain information and uh, again engage them on that level. So it, it, yeah, it was, it was just a rewarding uh, sort of experience. Uh, at the, again, like I said though, at the end of the day, it was still retail and there were too many hours of me just sort of sitting there waiting for customers to come in because at two o'clock in the afternoon, uh, yeah, even on a, on a Sunday, mm -hmm. there weren't always a lot of customers. Mm -hmm. So that's why I said, well, okay, I can do something that has a little more activity associated with it. So uh, being from Oregon, I'm curious, while you were there, did you, how much, how cognizant were you of the Oregon wine industry? Were, were there a lot of Oregon wines you were interacting with? Did you have much concept of what was, what was happening in Oregon? No, yes, well, yes and no. I mean, um, I think the first winery actually I ever visited was uh, Abacella. I think that was down in, actually in 2002. I came back to um, um, visit family for Thanksgiving and my sister was living in Ashland. So on the way back on Thanksgiving weekend, went to Abacella. So I learned stuff about them. I was cognizant of, of things happening. I knew, you know, knew about that Oregon is Pinot Noir country especially. Mm -hmm. um, but it's in more generic terms, uh, so I really started learning more about it after I, moved, again, moved to Chicago. I mm -hmm. uh, had a really interesting experience with uh, um, 
how people viewed Oregon and Oregon wines uh, in Chicago, mm -hmm. very positively, but it was always the people who had come out here mm -hmm. for a visit. And that's something that, that was really interesting is, oh, you know, we went to the Willamette Valley and um, we just had a great time and uh, visited some wineries. I go, oh, who'd you go visit? And they would say, I don't remember. So it was impressed upon me from an early point that, that sort of the Willamette Valley was in a sense a brand mm -hmm. and that the Willamette Valley uh, had a great reputation, but there was more work to do, I think, on the um, individual mm -hmm. winery level. Mm -hmm. Tell me the truth. They didn't actually call it the Willamette Valley, right? They called it like the Willamette Valley or Williamette Valley. Uh, you know, actually, people had been trained. I think if they had come uh, to Oregon on how to how to pronounce Willamette. Thankfully, good. even then, that's Thankfully, good. That's yes. good. So you you move back out to, to Oregon and yeah. uh, and you're you're taking classes and also you, you're diving right in. So you're, yeah. you're working. Uh, tell me about the experience both of first formal education and also of working at Illahee at the same time. Um, was it what you expected? Uh, was it different? What, what, what were your kind of first impressions of being in the industry? Um, so the, the school was, I think, fairly straightforward. I knew they had a, a um, you know, small winery on site mm -hmm. and a small vineyard on site. Um, it was very helpful to be able to go out and work groups and get you know, be hands-on with the vines and not simply sit in a um, um, classroom looking at slides and PowerPoints mm -hmm. and learning but the book knowledge. Um, so th but that was all pretty straightforward. Uh, I think it was working at, at Illahi and actually having the, the real hands-on work to do though that was um, uh, a little bit of a surprise, especially the cleaning aspect of it. Um, I mean, the amount of cleaning that goes on at a winery is crazy, but mm -hmm. it's super important. Uh, uh, the winemaker, Brad Ford, uh, had a sort of pre-harvest training session, and he said, cleaning is the most important thing we do. Mm -hmm. And then he launched into this um, uh, sort of um, rhapsodic uh, sort of uh, overview of soap and its chemical properties, and he's like, soap is the perfect substance. And talked all about how, you know, binds with you know, matter and sweeps it away and so on and so forth. But yes, uh, um, all kinds of cleaning um, uh, that goes on. I learned that, well, you know, maybe it's not bad to wear gloves because my hands are getting so chewed up by all the chemicals. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. but everything about learning how to uh, hook up a hose to a tank, uh, mm -hmm. how to rack wine, uh, how to filter, um, the school, teaches you those things, but the lessons, I think, will probably not stick unless you're also working at a winery. Mm -hmm. um, the Oregon wine industry has been very supportive of um, uh, programs such as Chemeketa. Mm -hmm. uh, there are, of course, a number of, of uh, winemaking schools uh, across the Northwest. And the, the whole goal, of course, is to make sure that um, the workers have a good solid background of um, a wide range of aspects uh, uh, into the wine business and how to make wine and how to uh, improve methods in the vineyard. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there's been a, a, a really nice sense of support from the industry for the um, learning aspect of it. So you had, a, I assume you had some sort of notion of what your work would be when you got into the industry. How, how different was what you actually were doing than what maybe you expected, or was it about what you expected to be doing when you first were working as a harvest intern? Well, again, uh, the cleaning aspect, the, the degree uh, of which uh, was there was a surprise. Um, other than that, it was pretty straightforward. I mean, you, you know, grapes come in, uh, they're harvested, here they are, they go into the sorting table, then they go into the uh, distemmer. Um, in most cases, uh, here now we have to move stuff around and now we have to move stuff around some more and then we have to move stuff around some more. Oh, more grapes are coming in, now we have to move stuff around some more. And just the you know, 12, 14 hour days that happened for um, the greater part of four to six weeks. Um, that was, it was lovely. Um, it was, it was, a, it was a, uh, again, a um, 
good way to become tired. <laughs> Did you ever uh, did you ever have any doubts uh, once you started? Did you ever have moments where you thought maybe this isn't really what I want to do, or were you pretty much hooked from from oh, day I, one? Yeah, I was hooked. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 a, a lot of fun. Uh, there's you know camaraderie in the cellar. Um, there's yeah, when grapes come in, there are various choices you have to make as a winemaker about how you're going to. Um, treat the fruit or not treat it mm -hmm. um, in terms of, oh, do I want to leave it whole cluster? Uh, do I want to um, uh, you know, destem? Do I want to uh, put it in certain types of vessels? And you know, do I want to do pump overs, punch downs, leave it alone, all that sort of thing. And the, the thing of it is, is that because each vintage is different, those, there's no recipe. Uh, those choices need to be made a new guided by experience uh, over the years. And so that's one of the things that I realized, I think even before I came back to Oregon, but certainly it was cemented uh, when I uh, returned to Oregon and started working in the wine industry, is that I will never stop learning. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a very gratifying thing. I, like, I will, uh, also, the pace of change is such that it is manageable for me. Uh, working in the technology aspect of it, developing websites, uh, developing learning content for um, for people, mm -hmm. the technology changes so quickly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is an extreme example, but you know, nobody programs in Cobalt anymore. Um, unfortunately, a lot of um, like government systems are still on some of those really old mm -hmm. ancient platforms. But that said, if you wanted to keep pace um, with the changes in technology and coding, uh, it was just dizzying and I just wasn't enjoying that anymore um, so I knew that with wine that I would be able to um, I I would have a, a better pace mm -hmm. of change to deal with I think mm -hmm. so uh, th that's that was part of the, the gratifying aspect of, of coming into the industry as well so you talked earlier about starting your own label, and, and you did it pretty pretty quickly. So tell me yeah. about the, the logistics of that, of, of finding that vineyard you wanted to work with. And, and obviously, you mentioned sort of getting it off the ground while you were being educated yeah. and how to get it off the ground, uh, naming yourself and deciding what you wanted to make and how you wanted to make it. Uh, tell me about the kind of process of the first couple of years of that. Sure. So when I st um, started um, farming at that vineyard, it was a complete accident uh, that I found that vineyard. Actually, I was helping somebody I was going to class with. He had taken a lease on that vineyard. And for various reasons, after a few months, he walked away uh, from that vineyard. So I took over the lease. Mm -hmm. um, and so I got it into my head because of the, uh, I was able to um, uh, take a lease as a sharecropper. And so sharecropping, of course, means that you're not paying the owner uh, any money up front, or at least it, it oftentimes does. It certainly did in my case. And uh, it was an affordable entree to say, hey, let's structure our agreement such that if I get fruit, if I don't get fruit, I don't pay you any money. But if I do get fruit, then you get either a payment from me after the, the wine is made, mm -hmm. or um, uh, I give you a portion of the grapes, one of the two things, mm -hmm. so that you can make your own wine. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I immediately saw this as an opportunity for me to start up a label because I was uh, didn't really have anything in savings, but hey, I had my arms and my legs and uh, my, my head and all that sort of thing, so I could actually go out there and, and do the work and um, uh, hopefully bootstrap my way into a winery. And in creating uh, the brand, uh, I was wondering, well, what should I name it? And it, it has, you know, long occurred to me that, uh, well, you know, uh, these European vignerons, they have, you know, family domains and they have a, like sort of uh, interesting story and, um, well, I don't have any of those things. And then I, then I realized, oh, wait, I said, I do. <laughs> and so I decided to name um, my winery uh, after my great, great, great grandfather. Um, whose name is Gabriel Franchere, and he was a native of Montreal, and he was part of the John Jacob Astor mission that founded Fort Astoria in 1811. Um, 
he kept a, um, a journal, and so he published his memoir uh, in French uh, after he returned to Montreal. So he was, he was in Oregon for three years. Uh, he was on the boat that went around South America. So he went down to New York, joined the Astro Mission. They took nine months to go around South America, and then eventually uh, end up in um, Astoria, or what would become Astoria. So they founded Fort Astoria. He was here for three years, uh, but because he kept, uh, he published a memoir, uh, my grandfather, Hoyt Francher, who was a, at that time a professor at Portland State University, he translated the memoir um, from the French uh, in the late 60s and uh, published it as a, a book called Adventure at Astoria. And that was published by the University of Oklahoma Press for whatever reason, I, I'm sure it was just who would take it. <laughs> Uh, but it was, you know, I, I was able to grow up with the story in some fashion. Mm -hmm. I didn't give it a lot of thought growing up. Oftentimes, I think young people don't care so much about their their family heritage, especially if the family doesn't really talk a lot about it, which my neither my grandparents nor my mother uh, did a lot of. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, I, I I knew the story growing up, and so. You know, looking back, uh, I was like, oh, he did a pretty cool thing. You know, he went out and did his own thing. He took a chance uh, to become an, uh, an explorer. Uh, you know, he's a, he's a clerk uh, in the mission, so he wasn't, um, you know, rowing uh, the boats over the Columbia Bar. Uh, but uh, that said, you know, he was still doing his thing. So I thought that, that spirit that he had um, was in keeping with my sort of diving into mm -hmm. wine. Mm -hmm. Pretty pretty punk rock. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So he. So yeah. He was here for three years, and uh, so the the Franchere label and ethos is, uh, you know, sort of a, a um, melding of my family history with Oregon history. Mm -hmm. So there's, uh, you know, it, within the brand, there's, uh, you know. Uh, an eye toward Oregon history. Mm -hmm. I'm also very cognizant of um, how uh, so much of the, the work that we as winemakers do now in the year 2020 is um, built upon the incredible work that, um, that uh, people such as David Lett did uh, back in the mid 60s, you know, when nobody would listen to them and uh, you know oh you're gonna fail and uh, who's gonna buy Oregon wine and people had to to make their own way they had to um, they did a lot of work to uh, have Oregon be where it is today which is one of the most respected wine regions in the world um, other wine regions uh, in the United States um, are experiencing some shortfalls in sales, and in Oregon, the industry is, seems to be going quite well. Um, we face a lot of challenges, uh, but they are challenges I think we can definitely manage. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, it's the, the work that we're doing now is made so much uh, easier by the fact uh, that uh, all, a lot of hard work was done uh, back in the 60s and 70s and 80s. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't think we'll ever, you know, get to the point where we forget the past. I think the wine industry in general is very good at, at recognizing its roots, but um, yeah, it's good to be mindful of that. Mm -hmm. Did you have a, when you started out, uh, did you have, uh, w with the grapes specifically you were making, was it basically just, these are the grapes I have access to, so this is what I'm going to make? Did you start, start looking for certain varietals you wanted to make down the road? Uh, tell me about the kind of decisions you were making on wines you were going to make and maybe size and growth and kind of those as you were thinking, uh, as you were getting started. Sure. Uh, starting with the grape varieties, um, some of it was just serendipitous. Uh, again. The vineyard that I was able to take a lease on was planted in Pinot Noir, as so many vineyards are, so that's what I had access mm -hmm. to. Uh, but I wanted to make Pinot Noir. Pinot Noir is, of course, our signature grape variety. Um, uh, Pinot has a, a way of expressing itself in Oregon that is, I think, very compelling, and so I wanted to try my hand at that. That said, um, I, uh, 
really cut my teeth on uh, European wines from um, uh, a wide number of especially cool climate regions. Uh, my favorite being the Loire Valley. And so all of those great varieties that they grow um, that are you know, indigenous to the Loire Valley, um, I think have so much to say. And I wanted um, non-Pinot grape varieties to be part of the conversation. I want them to be part of the conversation here in Oregon. Um, I find, like I said, Chenin Blanc, you know, Vouvray, um, uh, Chenin Blanc to be very compelling. Uh, Chenin Blanc was the grape that convinced me that terroir is real. The uh, Chenin that grows on limestone and clay soils in Vouvray tastes very different from the uh, Sauvignon uh, and Anjou areas that are more um, uh, driven by uh, schist in particular. And uh, also uh, mudstone and some other um, uh, sedimentary and metamorphic rocks. But that said, uh, you know, there's a Romorantin, uh, there's Zweigelt and uh, Blaufrankisch in Austria. Uh, there's just so many different grape varieties um, that I think have a lot to say. Uh, and so uh, when I uh, was at Illahi, there was a grower there uh, who was making his wine at Illahi as well. Um, uh, his name is Jeff Havlin, and so he planted out his vineyard to a lot of different grape varieties. Um, I think one of the, uh, I, I, I said, hey Jeff, I'll, I'll buy some Gruner Feldiner from you. And so I did that. Um, I accidentally, um, oh, that's not, maybe not the right word, uh, serendipitously uh, was able to, to get Syrah. I didn't actually know he was growing Syrah, um, but he, um, it was, you know, this is the rainy 2013 vintage. Um, so this would have been in, uh, early to mid-October, I think, uh, when he came to the winery, he had a, a bag of grapes, and he handed them to me and said, Mike, can you run some tests on these? So I took the bag, you know, squished up the grapes, opened it up, and was greeted by this blast of like black pepper. And I was like, oh my god, this is Syrah. This is like real, authentic Syrah. I didn't know that Syrah could be grown in the Willamette Valley and be what it should be. And so about an hour after I ran the test, um, uh, Brad said, oh yeah, um, yeah, just having a problem like uh, uh, selling a Syrah, the, the guy who said he would buy it isn't returning his calls. So I said, Jeff, I want that Syrah. And I'll, I will pay you cash on the barrel head for that. It was a small crop, so was, I could afford it. Uh, you know, it's like $1,500 or something like that. But I was like, I want that Syrah. And he said, you got it. So, um, and I've worked with it ever since. Uh, I think that Syrah um, has an important future in the Willamette Valley, um, especially as uh, our climate warms. Uh, but in reality, I don't think that Syrah has any problem uh, getting ripe. It ripens a few weeks after Pinot Noir, but because of its thicker skins and its looser clusters, it actually survives um, uh, wet uh, uh, events better mm -hmm. than Pinot Noir does. Mm -hmm. uh, Pinot Noir being so typically tight clustered and thin skinned and, and more prone to um, uh, some mold and, and rot. Uh, Syrah typically does better on that front. Mm -hmm. So if you let it go through the hang time and if you have it planted on uh, soils that are shallow enough uh, to express itself uh, the way it should be expressed, um, that can make us for really just a, a wonderful wine of beautiful typicity that is much more like a Northern Rhone Syrah than a, uh, you, you know, a warmer climate Syrah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, people think of Syrah as being a warm climate grape. Mm -hmm. One thing I like to remind people of though is that the city of Vienne in the Northern Rhone is only a hundred miles south of Burgundy. Um, it's the distance from Portland to Eugene. It's not far. Uh, it does require more heat or more heat accumulation to ripen than Pinot, but it essentially is a cool-ish to somewhat warm climate um, grape variety. It simply happens, to, I think, to do well in warm climates as well. It's much more flexible than Pinot Noir. Pinot Noir is very fussy. Uh, it, acidity drops very quickly. Um, and 
getting that sort of um, sugar acid balance mm -hmm. in Pinot Noir is difficult. You really have to be on your toes. Mm -hmm. um, there are certain things about Pinot Noir as, as it's ripening that you really have to pay attention to. Uh, it's uh, phenolics, you don't want it to be, uh, uh, if, if the sugar accumulation spikes too high but the grape it, and this phenolic development isn't complete, uh, it can be a little on the bitter side um, and astringent side of things. So you have to be careful with it. Syrah though, um, it will, you can just let it hang. And again, because of its disease resistance um, and because uh, um, it, at least on my site that I work with, this acidity does not drop at all, um, you uh, um, can just let it hang. Mm -hmm. And also, Syrah has a more one-to-one -one correlation with how it tastes to considering what the finished wine will be. Mm -hmm. So you will understand fairly easily it's ready. Uh, Pinot is not a grape you can simply taste and know how the wine is going to turn out. Mm -hmm. uh, that is to say there's not a one-to-one -one correlation uh, between the flavor of the grape and the flavor of the wine. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a lot of interesting things that happen in fermentation with uh, Pinot Noir that turn it into what it is, mm -hmm. and Syrah is a little more direct. It's a little easier to work with. Uh, Grunerfeld Liner, the same way. Uh, it typically ripens about a week after Pinot Noir, so I can sort of stage my harvest such that mm -hmm. it's Pinot first, then Gruner, then um, Syrah. It doesn't always work that way, but it's pretty close. And so, you know, that's what the, uh, you know, wine growers in the Piedmont did, these small family producers, is uh, you start with the uh, Dolcetto and pick that first, then the Barbera, and then finally the Nebbiolo, and they ripen sort of two weeks apart. And so it's uh, easier to stage your harvest when you have limited room and a limited, you know, set of hands to work with. So when you started, did you have uh, did you have a either a size in mind or a, a, did you, an ultimate goal? Did you I, I want to get to here at some point or? Yeah, the the goal for me is to um, make at least twelve hundred cases. Um, and go up to there, you know, possibly up to 2,000 cases. Um, that's a, a level at which you're able to do all the work yourself without hiring anyone uh, as an assistant. Um, because then once you hire somebody, you then have to pay them a wage, and then you have to make that much more to cover that, and so on and so forth. So um, I thought at least for my purposes in the near term to control my costs and to make sure that I can make a living at it is to go up to that 1200 case level, which I'm not at yet. Um, but uh, you know, I'll be around 1000 cases this year. Mm -hmm. And then go from there to um, hopefully in the next few years up to 2000. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that would be a, a nice way to, to, to manage my production. And uh, then from there, you know, we'll see what happens. Um, uh, I'm trying to do this again in a way where I'm not taking out bank loans, um, where I'm having to buy a lot of equipment. Um, so I'm trying to keep costs manageable. Um, so, yeah, that's the boring business side of things. <laughs> it's always interesting for me to see how people, for us, I think, to see how people make it work at that size yeah. and, 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 and scope. Uh, you obviously, you, you from, the, from the first wine you had that sort of turned you on to wine, you had a very specific idea of wine that, yes. you, or that appealed to you. So I'm curious, how did you translate that into your winemaking style, winemaking philosophy? What, what is it you do to make wines that you love, that you're happy with? So the, again, the wines that spoke to me, especially those where I would turn the bottle around and see the imported by Louis Dressner uh, selections label on there is, um, you know, they were pretty much promoting the um, l lower alcohol levels. So picking on the earlier side rather than late um, maintaining freshness and acidity, um, and uh, native yeast fermentations. Mm -hmm. So all these things are super common right now. They're, uh, they're almost like de rigueur in, in the Oregon winemaking industry. But back then, 2005, uh, 2004, 2005, it was um, a lot less prevalent. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, what these wines really stood out. So uh, it didn't matter. Um, whether I was drinking traditionally made um, you know, wine from the Piedmont 
or uh, you know these weirdo varieties from Val d'Asta, uh, Austria, Loire Valley, wherever. The wines that spoke to me were on that fresher, mm -hmm. uh, less manipulated side of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And so I knew going into it, that's the kind of wine I wanted to make. Um, and so there was a, again, a um, philosophy set forth that was easy for me to step into. Mm -hmm. uh, then, once you are ready to start making the wine, then you learn um, how difficult it is to uh, um, follow those um, procedures in a way that uh, makes a wine not just drinkable, but wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, 2012, especially the, the first year, I made small amounts of wine. Um, uh, pretty much made every mistake in the book. And so that was nice to sort of get a lot of that out of the way. Uh, and I also learned that how difficult it is to make wine in small quantities, just how much more vulnerable uh, wine is to um, oxygen in small quantities. And making wine in larger quantities was actually um, easier, just simply by the volume of material you're working with. Uh, oxidation, for example, doesn't become such mm -hmm. an issue. Uh, but in tandem with that was, again, um, uh, the learning at Shemeca and learning about the, the science aspect of it, about you know, redox reactions, about how important oxygen is for uh, early in the fermentation process um, to make sure that the yeasts are, are happy mm -hmm. and healthy, um, and how to um, you know, manage your, your wines so that they're not getting infected with Acetobacter and uh, all those other lovely bugs. I'm curious about a vintage like 2019 being so different than the vintages immediately preceding it. Obviously, we had a kind of a long string of fairly hot, dry vintages, and then you have a yeah. 2019. So tell me about, uh, for you specifically, uh, what did you need to, what kind of tools did you need to flex this year that you hadn't had to use before? What kind of judgments did you have to make that maybe you hadn't made in a while? Well, this is where I think, again, experience comes in handy. Um, there were a lot of issues, pretty much practically every issue you could want to or want not to deal with. Um, uh, previous years were pretty easy, but the first thing was that we had at, um, the first half of July and the first half of August were very cloudy. Mm -hmm. They were very humid and um, powdery mildew uh, unfortun unfortunately decimated some vineyards. Um, so with the vines that I'm farming knew that okay, you have to be out there every seven days to spray the sulfur, otherwise mm -hmm. things will go south quickly. Um, you can be out there one day and really not see much of anything the way of powdery mildew, and then the next day it's everywhere. So it's, it's um, something that you, you just don't fool around with it. Mm -hmm. So the first um, hurdle was the powdery mildew. If you don't deal with the powdery mildew, then what happened next, of course, with all the rain, um, that is going to just be a, a recipe for um, just complete crop failure. Mm -hmm. um, and again, that is something that did happen to some people. Um, it, you know, nothing's as, as completely avoidable. Uh, so for example, in a um, late ripening block of uh, Pinot Blanc that I'm working with, lost probably about 25% of the crop. Uh, but the other 25%, uh, the other 75% of the crop was fantastic. Uh, so, learning to not panic, first of all, um, y you know, I, again, I, I sort of uh, am looking for, um, uh, let me re rephrase that, I am looking for um, freshness and um, vivacity in my wines, uh, delicacy when the grape variety calls for it. Um, but uh, you still need to make sure that the grape is ripe when you pick it and not panic and pick it too early. Mm -hmm. So waiting things out, uh, making sure that the leaves are pulled uh, to open up the canopy so it can survive, so can the, the grapes can dry off quickly mm -hmm. in between all the showers. Um, that's, that's important. Mm -hmm. um, the other problem is, uh, again, knowing your site. Um, 
how to deal with birds. This We had the worst bird pressure, I think, since 2010. Mm -hmm. uh, all the storms that sweep through, storms actually have a tendency, in some cases, to uh, bring the migrating bird populations with them. So the bird pressure was high. But we, again, got out there and we realized that the um, ripening was probably going to take place um, right around the 1st of October or a little later. Mm -hmm. um, these things are pretty much knowable based upon um, when bud break occurs and when flowering occurs especially. Mm -hmm. And uh, so in the vineyards that are particularly um, uh, prone to bird pressure, you get the nets out. And nets are the only thing that work. Um, cannons are just like a dinner bell. Somebody, I, I didn't come up with that. Somebody, somebody described it as like basically like a dinner bell. They learn um, what to do uh, in response to human actions. And it just the physical barrier of nets is really the only thing that works. Mm -hmm. So it's, again, extra work. But if you put in the work, if you're just present, I, you know, if 95% of success in life is just showing up, um, showing up in this case means being timely with your sprays mm -hmm. uh, and um, putting nets up if you have bird pressure. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was Al McDonald, uh, uh, who um, was the proprietor of uh, Andon and now known as Seven Springs. Mm -hmm. uh, apparently, uh, his solution for bird pressure was grow more grapes. <laughs> so that works too. <laughs> I'm curious, uh, in your case, uh, you have a good amount of experience, but a fairly short time span. Uh, at what point do you start feeling comfortable making those kinds of decisions, knowing what you have to know, basically? What point did you, uh, do you know about how, how often you have to spray, how often you have to be there, bird netting, all those kinds of things? What point do you feel comfortable making those decisions sort of autonomously? Well, actually, fairly quickly mm -hmm. uh, and that's the benefit of the of the education mm -hmm. uh, so um, Jessica Cortell was my uh, viticulture instructor uh, at, at Chemeketa and she impressed upon us if you if you don't if you're following an organic spray program and you're not going out there every seven to ten days um, uh, you're at real risk mm -hmm. and here's how you watch for powdery mildew here are the signs to look for here are the weather conditions to look for uh, and Again, you just have to pay attention to those mm -hmm. things, and so the, the that guidance, um, uh, which you know people had developed, uh, you know, the hard way over the years, uh, but between the the research and experience of, of predecessors, it was made fairly clear to us. Here's what you got to do. Mm -hmm. So it was those kinds of decisions are um, the easier ones. Mm -hmm. uh, the hard decisions are um, when exactly to pick every year. Because oftentimes, especially with Pinot Noir, there is going to be a trade-off between um, sugar levels and um, acid levels and just simply the, the phenolic development of the skins themselves. Um, that's the kind of thing where you, it's always a, a little bit of a leap of faith. Um, you can check your numbers, you can hit your targets, um, but there's always going to be a question mark about what is this. Uh, since I uh, exclusively work with native yeast fermentations, I'm also not managing the strains of uh, the yeast populations, let alone the overall different types of yeast. Because mm -hmm. uh, of course Saccharomyces uh, cerevisiae doesn't take over until about halfway through the fermentations. Mm -hmm. There's all other kinds of uh, yeast species that are, that are in there, and I'm not pre-selecting them. So I'm, I'm definitely rolling the dice there and saying, you know, the, the wine will be what it'll be in, in some sense. But that's the exciting part too, because then you can have, um, you can learn more. You can you can choose to learn from the site if you're if you're patient and do this process year after year. The site will tell you what it's delivering. Um, there are scientific studies that show that um, there are uh, certain strains of Saccharomyces that are um, uh, indigenous to a region. And some that are, are specific even to uh, a vineyard, mm -hmm. uh, as well as, of course, um, whatever's living at the, the winery as well. So it, you will get a sense of what the place um, uh, needs, what it's communicating, and what it's um, doing to uh, incorporate the, uh, its surroundings um, and its, uh, how it's influenced by its um, uh, local microflora population. 
a lot of control to cede over to nature there. I imagine that has to be kind of difficult at first to have that kind of leap of faith. Well, it was what I was looking for. I knew that it was going to be a leap of faith, um, but that's that's part of the magic. I've never uh, made it a specific goal to have wine taste the same each time. That's part of the cool thing about wine is it's going to taste different from vintage to vintage, mm -hmm. especially. Uh, if you have that sort of more minimal intervention mm -hmm. process, but if you're, you know, adding a whole bunch of, of stuff to the wine, you know, the enzymes to, to maximize fruitiness and uh, certain kinds of, of uh, you know, yeast you buy off the shelf uh, that again imparts very specific uh, flavors and characteristics to the wine. You know, if that's your goal, you can manage that. If your goal is to have it be wildly different from year to year. And just have the site and the vintage and the grape variety express itself, um, then you sort of come at it uh, understanding that there's a seeding of control, and that's the point. Hmm. So that it wasn't actually that difficult uh, for for me personally to uh, get used to that. Uh, it is difficult to sort of uh, come across. Uh, issues that do arise during fermentation. Oh no, this is, suddenly there's like a lot of ethyl acetate in this, you know, one fermenter. Um, and you think you've done everything right, and then something starts going uh, a little haywire. But again, that, that's part of the process. Um, we're always seeking to uh, improve our processes for ensuring, um, you know, interesting, tasty, saleable wines and not simply microbiological train wrecks. So, uh, yeah, I, I've had to dump wine. You know, it's, that's, that's, that's the difficult part. It's like, wow, I just paid $4,000 for those grapes and here I am mm -hmm. and it's, I have to toss out the whole batch. Fortunately, that hasn't happened too often, but. That's the goal. Yeah. Tell me about, you talk about saleable wine. Tell me about selling wine, especially as, as a small label uh, getting started in this in this kind of era, how, how do you sell your wine? How have you found success on that scale? So I don't have a tasting room. Um, I work exclusively through the wholesale market. My goal all along was to work with specific dis distributors um, in various states mm -hmm. that were friendly to my uh, method of winemaking mm -hmm. uh, and to the um, sort of uh, different grape varieties and expressions that I that I'm uh, developing. So, uh, the selling wine is much more difficult than making it. Mm -hmm. And so, I had a specific goal of um, starting uh, to really bring my uh, wines to market in a larger way with out-of-state distributors uh, starting in January of 2016. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, distributors just weren't biting. I was having, uh, I was basically blocked at every turn. Mm -hmm. And finally, I was able to get on that um, uh, um, list of distributors that I was looking to work for, work, work with um, in January of 2017. But that put me a year behind um, financially, so yeah, the, the whole time I was, um, you know, if I started out, like I said, working at Oregon State University, but then I transitioned um, to doing the wine full time and then doing freelancing uh, with the computer work um, to, uh, you know, tide me over on uh, skimpy, what was by then skimpy wages. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, that was that was tough, um, but if you if you make an authentic product and you're making interesting wines, you can fit into a niche. So I'm, I specifically chose distributors um, in New York and in California in particular uh, to bring my wines to market. Um, uh, the, the California distributor I work with is um, very much focused on natural wines. Uh, and the New York distributor that I really, really, really wanted to work with uh, who I am now working with, uh, they were the, they're the ones who distribute the, those Louis Dressner wines in New York. So uh, uh, they, were the, they were and are the perfect match for me, but it took time to get there. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was grateful when they finally said, hey, let's, let's work together. Mm -hmm. um, and so you, you have to start off small. You have to recognize that it takes uh, typically 
um, 18 to 24 months to really introduce a brand into market before it becomes sort of, oh yeah, I know those wines where they, the sommeliers and the wine buyers and, um, uh, and whatnot were, are saying, oh, okay, th I, this is interesting stuff, mm -hmm. or I trust these wines, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. something along those lines. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, just getting a, a toehold and being able to build on that is, it takes time, so you just have to be patient. Um, the, um, the nice thing is that uh, so many of the old rules have been broken about what wines are, uh, what makes a, like I said, a saleable wine. Mm -hmm. um, uh, people are uh, no longer interested in wines that just fit a, a template. Um, you can't really color within the lines anymore and expect that that's good enough. Uh, so I have, um, in addition to simply working with uh, other grape varieties, such as uh, Gruner Feltliner and Syrah, they're a little more unexpected, mm -hmm. uh, do some you know, fun, uh, you know, unusual blends. Mm -hmm. So I have a red blend that actually has 8% um, uh, uh, Gruner Feltliner in it. Um, it's a you know, light red, but it's very much modeled on the uh, very drinkable, quaffable, um, lighter um, red wines of the Loire Valley. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was very much inspired by those wines that are very affordable and interesting and just, yeah, like I said, just really drinkable um, as my template for creating something that was, uh, I wanted to be a uh, sort of a unique take on regional terroir. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So that's why it's mostly Pinot Noir, but um, uh, Gruner Feltliner, Gamay, and Syrah in the blend. Uh, and that's just an, an example of one of my wines that is uh, a little off the beaten track mm -hmm. that interests people and uh, says, oh, this is tasty, this is fun, this is unusual, um, but just super drinkable. Mm -hmm. uh, it does not, uh, uh, f if, if your model for, um, for red wine is always to be, you know, sort of big and you know tons of, of fruit and just leave it at that and that's fortunately there are so many more widely accepted um, uh, ways of experiencing wine so you still have those those bigger wines and that's great uh, but there's uh, other wines that are um, lighter uh, that are more, a little more offbeat that have just more unusual flavors mm -hmm. I'm curious when it came to actually taking your own wine to market and now you have a, a product that you have poured yourself into and that is not authentic and something you're passionate about. I'm curious about how you deal with either being ignored or, or being turned down or how do you develop that kind of thick skin when it comes to marketing your own product? Well, um, um, I, I think in terms of uh, Taking the wines out to wine buyers, the, uh, the, the folks at restaurants and shops who are purchasing, uh, you have to understand that they're getting visits from sales reps left and right uh, all day, every day. And there's only so many wines they can bring in. Uh, so if they choose not to work with my wine, um, I understand that. Mm -hmm. And so I don't take that personally. Um, sometimes if you're at a, um, public event and somebody doesn't like your wine and they let you know, it does feel, wow, I worked, you know, you just told me you hate my wine. And uh, that's fine because it's, they're not for everyone, but when somebody tells you that, that's still just sort of like a little bit of, you know, a little bit, little bit of a wound there and you, you have to sort of, um, just sort of slough it off and move on. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, but I mean, um, uh, the, the, I think the bigger challenge now in selling wines um, in the wholesale market is that the, 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 the market has completely changed over the years. The old days, you would have um, larger restaurants who could say, for example, build fine wine programs and have deep lists and they would have the storage space for it. Almost all of the restaurants that are being uh, developed now in the bigger cities mm -hmm. um, that are more amenable to sort of more offbeat wines taking a much smaller footprint, mm -hmm. smaller wine lists, uh, and they're going through, rotating through them pretty quickly. So that can give you an entree into 
um, getting on those lists, but that entree is oftentimes going to be for a brief period of time mm -hmm. and maybe only a couple of cases sold. Um, when you can uh, find an account that, that works with many more cases than that, that, that can be uh, nice. But uh, that's, that's a big challenge, uh, is um, how much um, pressure is being faced economically mm -hmm. and um, uh, by restaurants, because their margins are so slim and they're getting slimmer by the day. So selling wines that say maybe cost um, 40 to $50 retail, that's a heavy pull basically in the, in the um, uh, wholesale market. Mm -hmm. So that's where it's very helpful to have a tasting room. And I don't, like I said, I don't have one. So tasting rooms, um, you will have a much better uh, success rate at selling those um, more expensive wines. Mm -hmm. You talked about kind of the the sort of not necessarily nightmare, but the, the the worst possible scenario to reaction to your wine, which is someone telling you how much they don't like it. Yeah. What would be what would be the ultimate <laughs> takeaway? What's what do you want someone to take away from a bottle? What would be the best response you could get to one of your wines? Mm, I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, I think um, if somebody says uh, I've never tasted anything like this before and I love it. That's a great response. Um, if it's, oh, this is um, uh, a really good representation of this vineyard that I know well, uh, that is a great response as well. Uh, so it can be something that embraces typicity or embraces uh, uniqueness. Um, I really enjoy uh, opening people's eyes to the possibilities in some of these other grape varieties. Again, uh, Syrah in particular. Mm -hmm. uh, not many people have um, have a too specific. Uh, actually, let me rephrase that. Um, in the market, there is a um, desire to have Gruner Feltliner be one type of thing. So when you encounter a buyer who is willing to say, "Oh, this is a different and unique take on it," um, that is uh, that is gratifying. And it's, uh, the thing about Gruner Feltliner actually is it is. Uh, um, a very protean grape variety. It actually does really well expressing itself in different uh, ways mm -hmm. based upon how it's grown, where it's grown, how it's vinified. It's not unlike um, uh, a lot of terroir driven uh, grapes in that respect. The American market has been a little more closed minded about that because they are looking more for a specific style of mm -hmm. you know, fresh linear uh, Gruner as opposed to something that's more exotic, um, which my Willamette Valley uh, Gruner can be. Um, Syrah, on the other hand, uh, I love that it can show that sort of um, northern Rhone typicity of black pepper and olives and meats, uh, you know, more savory expression. Mm -hmm. And um, if I can do that and say, wow, that is like that is a bang on Syrah, that's that's the compliment that I'm, I'm you know, looking for uh, for that uh, wine that I make. Mm -hmm. So uh, tell me about the, your sort of uh, first impression of the Oregon wine industry more generally, more holistically, uh, when you came to it, uh, either from, uh, from a wine buyer perspective or when you started working in it. What was your sort of initial impression of the industry at large and, and maybe how that has changed now that you're in it, you've been in it for a while, and, and the, you and the industry have both changed a little bit? Yeah. Um, Oregon had and still has, thankfully, a wonderful reputation as a pristine place. Mm -hmm. um, it is one of the first things that people think of uh, about Oregon is about how clean and green it is. Uh, the sun we're experiencing right now in the middle of winter, maybe not so much. Um, but, you know, um, it's interesting to, you know, when people are learning about the region and they've never really been to the Willamette Valley and they say, well, our summers are warm and dry. And they go, oh, really? I thought it just rained all the time. And so, you know, there's, there's a, that little bit of learning there. But um, in terms of how people and how uh, I view Oregon, is, is I think um, it's been good and it's going on an even better trajectory. Uh, more people are embracing organic farming, uh, fewer inputs into the vineyard. Um, and um, the people are, treat their vineyards very seriously and with a lot of contemplation 
about how they can grow the best quality fruit. That is, um, uh, again, something that, that always was and still is. Um, there are, of course, uh, some grape growers that are, uh, have hundreds of acres uh, where they are trying to, to boost up the yields for more commodity wines. Um, that is something that's also happening. But the majority of, of growers are focused on that quality. So uh, when you have these uh, industry confabs, like the Oregon Wine Symposium, it's how can we make sure um, we're doing the best job we can to boost quality. Quality is, is the, the benchmark here. And um, because that's been Oregon's message over the years as well, buyers understand that and they expect Oregon wines to uh, uh, have um, quality as its primary concern. Mm -hmm. And that's great. I think that's very healthy. Um, so, so, sorry, remind, remind me of the question? Sort of your first impression of Oregon wine and, and, and maybe where it, where it is now. What does the Oregon wine industry look like now in, yeah. in 2020? Um, uh, vineyards are coming at a, at a very rapid rate. Um, a lot of people are saying there's too much Pinot Noir grown. Um, I'm not sure if that's true or not. Um, I think that it's important that we maintain Pinot Noir as a flagship variety, but I think it's equally important that we diversify mm -hmm. um, because I think that actually um, is a great way of broadening Oregon's story and deepening it, say, well, there's a lot of things that can work here. And we're doing things to uh, address climate change from um, different viticulture methods uh, to protect our Pinot Noir from uh, heat spikes and whatnot, uh, and overly warm temperatures in, in general. Mm -hmm. And then there are those varieties that will simply uh, be easier to work with in those warmer temperatures. Mm -hmm. So I think, again, um, that's, that's something that, is, that has changed quite a bit uh, in Oregon. When I, when I, again, when I started getting into wine, it was really all about Pinot Noir. Pinot Gris, a little bit of an afterthought. Chardonnay, kind of even less of an afterthought uh, in the marketplace as I experienced it in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's been such a huge um, growth in Chardonnay uh, amongst producers, uh, who are the, the fine producers, mm -hmm. um, who are um, looking at uh, that variety as being uh, something to become elevated and stand alongside Pinot Noir mm -hmm. as much as it does in Burgundy. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there's a lot of room for uh, your, uh, uh, your Zweigelts, your Blaufrankisches, your Grunerfeldliners, I have just named three Austrian grape varieties because he was on my mind. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the Austrian wine industry is actually, there's a lot of parallels actually with um, Austria mm -hmm. in terms of our, our climate. We're you know, obviously you know, warmer than, than Germany. Um, uh, there are wine growing regions in France that are the same parallel. Uh, some, sometimes hotter summers, especially on the Eastern Plains. Uh, I think, yeah, Austrian grape varieties are, have a, a warm, uh, a nice future mm -hmm. here as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, that's part of what's exciting about terroir in general is saying, hey, here's how our terroir or our various terroirs uh, interpret these grapes differently. And so as a winemaker, that's a lot of fun. And I think it's fun for the consumer too. Um, uh, I don't think anyone wants to walk into a tasting room anymore and simply have five Pinot Noirs and call it a day, uh, if that's the only option. Now, if, you, if a tasting room offers that and that's what people want, that's great. But I think it's important for wineries to have other selections mm -hmm. uh, and not simply just a rosé of Pinot Noir, then here's our Pinot Noir. Um, but uh, increasing um, uh, quantity and types of, of white wines, mm -hmm. um, uh, treating Pinot Gris differently. I do not make a varietal Pinot Gris, but I do it as more of an orange wine concept. Um, and so that's become quite a thing is to have, some people are doing it as a varietal uh, Pinot Gris as a red wine or as an orange wine, um, uh, Ramado style as well. And so I'm doing it as a, as a, as a blend of Pinot Gris with Grunerfeldliner, mm -hmm. but as an orange wine. Uh, yeah, it's just, again, it allows you to look at a grape variety through a different lens mm -hmm. and say, okay, 
in turn, here's what the grape is telling us about um, how it's grown here and how it's interpreted, how, how it's interpreting the site in this wine. Mm -hmm. So, what about as you look ahead for the industry? What is it? What's going to change in the next decade? What is it going to look like in, in 2030? Ooh, boy. Uh, no idea. No idea. Um, I, I'm going to take some stabs in the dark, though. Um, Oregon will continue to be recognized uh, through a qualitative lens. Um, it will still be able to um, sell well at uh, non-commodity prices. Um, if there is a, an ongoing expansion of, of vineyard land, um, there will be some downward price pressure. I mean, there already has been. I mean, again, it was after uh, the, the financial crash in 2008 that, that really changed the market, mm -hmm. that made it much more difficult to sell uh, expensive wines through, through wholesale and changed the, the way that restaurants, you know, just what their business model is. Mm -hmm. um, but in, I think that will accelerate. Um, I think that uh, um, we, will become, I think, um, almost as well known for a few other grape varieties, where those grape varieties are right now is a little open question. I think that Gamay is a leading contender for being um, one of the next sort of tentpole mm -hmm. varieties. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that my guess is that, uh, I mean, I've, already people are grafting over Pinot Gris to Chardonnay. Uh, I think that Pinot Gris, um, has a, I think there's going to be a retrenchment on Pinot Gris. I think it, Oregon will not be as, as well known for its Pinot Gris 10 years from now mm -hmm. as it is today. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, the tasting room experience is already changing a lot uh, from my understanding. Mm -hmm. um, there have been a number of producers who are essentially closing their tasting room in terms of uh, just open like, open hours mm -hmm. to appointment only. Mm -hmm. uh, they're looking for seated tastings, um, and they are. Uh, I'm not sure why they're doing that uh, exactly. I don't know if it makes more sense financially for them. It, I mean, it, it must, but in, for what reasons? I'm not sure. Um, I think there's going to be an acceleration of that, especially because as the uh, boomers start, um, for lack of a better term, staying home more uh, uh, and not, uh, I think the number of people who are going out for wine tasting experiences um, are going to be um, decreasing. Mm -hmm. There is a, um, uh, a real sense of dynamism in the market for other beverages. Uh, I think that um, Hard seltzer is, for example, a, I think it's gonna be a flash in the pan. Frankly, I think it's like Bartles and James. But there will always be products like that that, other, that people are looking for that uh, seem a little more casual. So I think that um, the wine industry is going to respond to it by putting even more wine in cans. And um, uh, we're gonna see, uh, I think, an acceleration of wine being seen as more of a fun and informal beverage um, and, and less on the serious furrowed brow um, aspect of things. Interesting predictions. I, I like that. That's a good, pretty good stabs in the dark. I appreciate it. What about for yourself as you look ahead for the future, for yourself and your brand? What are you, you, said, you said you kind of have a target size in mind. Yeah. Uh, what else are you looking ahead for in the future? Uh, new varieties you're going to try? Uh, other sort of other plans for the future? Um, Pinot Blanc is going to become a uh, more prominent part of my production. Um, when I first s started drinking wine and I would experiment with Pinot Blanc, I was like, oh man, is there any grape variety that can be more boring? This has to be literally the most boring grape variety on the planet. Um, and some of those wines, yeah, are really dull. Uh, but especially when treated to skin contact, um, there are some fabulous things that happen with that grape. Uh, and of course, I've also had my eyes open to more traditionally made Pinot Blanc that's made with great care. Uh, so that's something I want to work more with. Uh, the Austrian varieties, 
hmm? clearly on my brain. Um, <laughs> that Blaufrankisch, especially. Um, uh, Zweigelt is a lot of fun to drink. It's uh, something that's um, not difficult to understand. It's, um, uh, you know, it, it crops well, so you can sell it for a reasonable price. And it's, yeah, it's something different. Um, and, you know, people don't, your average consumer, your average wine consumer, um, doesn't know what these things are. And they, especially if they are, they like wine, they are interested and open to trying new things. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes if I'm uh, at a public event, for example, and I'm pouring Gruner Felt Liener, uh, they see the umlauts and they think it's sweet and I have to know, know it's dry. And is it anything like Gewürztraminer? And I'm like, no, it's not like Gewürztraminer. It's, it's different. Uh, but typically they say, you know, I've never heard of that. Mm -hmm. And so there's, um, it's, it's lovely to have somebody's eyes light up and say, oh wow, I've never tasted anything like this again. Or, mm -hmm. um, or just say, you know, this is, this is interesting. This is new and different. Mm -hmm. And so that sort of, um, the, the, the fact that there are more consumers out there that are interested in trying different things is, yeah, it's gratifying. Mm -hmm. It's nice. Mm -hmm. um, so it, the notion of working with different grape varieties um, is something I want to continue. Um, I would love to work with Shannon Blanc, mm -hmm. as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, frankly, w what it would look like in Oregon, because we don't have schist. Um, we have precious little mudstone, and we don't have really any limestone. Mm -hmm. um, so where can it grow? Um, you know, what will its expression be mm -hmm. um, he, on our soils and our climate? Mm -hmm. Don't know, and it will take a long time to find out. And I don't have a place to plant it. Um, you know, we'll see if I can convince some grower at some point if, that I work with if they have a uh, space available. Hey, you want to graft over your Pinot Gris? Maybe try some Shannon. Um, and you know, I'd be happy to, to pay for that. But that bridge I have not yet been able to cross. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, more Loire varieties, mm -hmm. more Austrian varieties. Mm -hmm. Sorry, if uh, someone were to approach you and wanted to join the Oregon wine industry, uh, what would your words of wisdom to them be? Um, people think about um, wine as winemaking. I would encourage them to do two things. First of all, to think about it as wine growing. So. Uh, understand the plants to your to the to your best ability. Um, uh, I've learned a lot of things about grapevines that I never understood before. Uh, they do weird things. Uh, it's like they make decisions in a sense on their own, and you just have to sit back and let them make their own choices. Uh, specifically uh, around water usage. So in 2017, um, we had that god awful heat. Uh, 105 degree days, several of them. Mm -hmm. The plants freaked out. Uh, they shut down their ripening process. They are supposed to be metabolizing, um, you know, at a constant rate. Anytime it's over 60 degrees Fahrenheit, mm -hmm. uh, they the plants realized that they were going to um, basically uh, lose all their water transpired out for, for you know in this god awful heat. So they shut down to preserve what water they had access to, and they did that for several weeks. Um, and then at the end of the season, they started the ripening cycle back up again, but it was very slow to come back, mm -hmm. and the, the sugar levels never really spiked the way I was expecting them to. I thought they would sort of bounce back, um, but they did not. And it was very slow, so even though 2017 was a hot year, it had all the aspects of it cool vintage. Mm -hmm. It was very strange. Um, and it's interesting to think about that experience um, uh, in the light of climate change. Uh, we know that there will be uh, uh, a greater risk of um, extreme events mm -hmm. from extreme rain to extreme heat. Mm -hmm. And so not all is lost for Pinot Noir in the sense that, you know, if there's a, an extreme heat spike rather than just steadier hot temperatures, that 
if the plant decides to protect itself, we might be able to still grow Pinot Noir 50 years from now, depending on our viticulture methods and, mm -hmm. and luck. Mm -hmm. um, uh, 2018 uh, also was warm, not as hot, but the, the, the vines didn't totally shut down their ripening process, but for whatever reason, uh, and this I think was actually something that happened up and down the west coast, it wasn't just in Oregon, but acidity levels stayed quite high. So even though uh, the sugar levels were advancing, they never got out of control, that was very nice, but even as they crept towards you know moderate to moderately high levels, the acidity held on. It didn't drop off the way it normally did. And 2018 is just a phenomenal vintage. Uh, again, very easy to work with, but the, the plants did their own thing. You can't control that as a winemaker. Say, hey, plant. Uh, I mean, there's certain things you can do in terms of leaf pulling and uh, bunch exposure, you know, uh, to get sunlight and air movement in to um, affect some of the internal dynamics, but you can't control everything. So, um, yeah, uh, um, that's that's a, a interesting dynamic to think about. So, in getting back to uh, how, uh, what I would um, recommend to people who want to get into the industry is understand your plants, but then also make sure you drink widely uh, before you get in, so you really understand much more about the entire wine world. Um, the I found it just invaluable to get a better uh, look at, and never completely understand, but get a better look at what was happening in southern Italy, northern Italy, uh, the Rhone Valley, the Loire Valley, uh, every wine growing region as, uh, as much as possible to see what are people doing that's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, what is the what is it that I'm really going for here? Um, there's a phenomenon known as cellar palate, mm -hmm. whereby winemakers who only drink their own wines don't understand what's what's going on, and they uh, uh, end up making wines that are maybe not as good as they could be because they are not looking widely, more widely. Um, and so I would say that if you get that understanding, or if you get a better understanding of what's going on in the wine world, you can uh, bring to your uh, project more clarity about the methods you want to pursue and the products you want to bring to market, mm -hmm. and how they might play uh, at the retail level. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I um, really appreciated about Loire Valley wines in particular is how affordable they were. Mm -hmm. And as a person who didn't have lots of money working at the university, I really appreciated being able to have some really interesting, high quality uh, wines that I could afford that too often were not available in the United States. Mm -hmm. That is one thing that is changing in Oregon. There are uh, more of the younger producers are looking at making interesting wines that come in at that um, 20 ish, 25-ish, maybe up to $30 price point. But the, it's, if you're a new producer who's seeking to sell a $50 bottle of Pinot Noir right out of the gate, you're not going to be successful because, or at least you won't be right away, because there are other people who are doing that, and they're doing it very well, and they have the track record and the customer base mm -hmm. that allows them to do that a new person coming to the industry has to think differently mm -hmm. and manage their expectations accordingly. I would say if you can work in a vineyard uh, as well as working in a winery, that's very helpful. At least, for, at least for some length of time to just get a better experience of, of again, the whole wine growing mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. All the questions that I have for you today. Is there anything okay. that I didn't ask that I should have? Anything we didn't cover that we should have covered? I don't think so. All right. Well, That's it. excellent. Well, thank you so much. For thank your you time for having today. me. I really appreciate it. Uh, sharing all your stories and uh, watch you off the hook.